Welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Whether you're new to fresh water or have been with us for years, we're so glad you're here as improving our waters takes effort from each and every one of us. My name is Valerie Forbes and I'm the chair of Freshwater's Board of Directors. I'm also the Dean of the University of Minnesota's College of Biological Sciences. We all have a unique water story, those experiences in our lives that have increased our bonds and connections to the water we use daily and can so easily take for granted. My water story began even before I can remember. I've always been a water girl, whether it's fresh water, marine water, or estuarine, I've always been in love with water, so much so that I never grew out of it. And when I became an adult, I started to study aquatic ecology, which I still do today when I'm not doing deanly things. And in my free time, my favorite place to be is in, on, or near water. So I encourage you to listen to the other water stories you'll hear today and to take time to reflect on your own. Today, you'll hear from people working for clean water for Minnesotans from St. Paul to Washington, D.C as we move upstream of Minnesota's waters to the systems and policies that shape our water for future generations. We hope to spark your curiosity and that you leave here today with a clear understanding of how freshwater is working to improve these policies and ways you can take a next step for water. One important way that we can all take part is through the act of giving a financial contribution to help us achieve our vision for clean and abundant water for all Minnesotans, now and in the future. People like you power the work you'll hear about today, and for that, we thank you. Now, without further ado, it's time for our next stop on this journey upstream, a stop to meet John Link Stein. John is Freshwater's Executive Director. He goes by Link with family and friends. He spent a 40-year career in state government working for public and environmental health most recently as the Commissioner of the Pollution Control Agency. He's going to help set the stage today by telling you more about who Freshwater is and what we do. Welcome, John. Thank you so much, Valerie. Valerie's exactly right. Water has been my career's work, my life's work. My water story begins with my awe and wonder viewing the flood of the Mississippi River in 1965 on the bluffs from Mounds Park in St. Paul. My dad wanted me to see this incredible, powerful event. And seeing that flood gave me perspective about how water impacts people and their livelihoods. My career's journey was to protect and restore Minnesota's waters. And that journey has led me to Freshwater, a small but mighty Minnesota nonprofit who's been on a mission since the 1960s to inspire and empower people to value and preserve our lakes, our rivers, our wetlands, and our groundwater. Our policy efforts are helping to solve some of the state of Minnesota's most tough problems and challenges. We work to create better, stronger, more resilient systems to protect and restore water. We work to improve and strengthen laws and policies that protect and restore water and human health. We work to assure effective use of state funds for water protection and restoration. We're known for doing all this work in a bipartisan, science-based manner that garners trust and support from people on both sides of the aisle. At Freshwater, one of our greatest calls to action at this moment is to welcome more diverse voices and communities' perspectives in these conversations so that water is protected for everyone in Minnesota and downstream. We hope you will join us in this incredible and important journey. Fresh water is engaged as ever in our work at the state capitol this year. Today, we want to thank you for being such an important part of the freshwater community. Your support fuels our initiatives that you're going to hear about today. And it helps make our vision for clean, safe water for all Minnesotans a reality. Next, I want to welcome one of Minnesota's congressional leaders, U.S. Senator Tina Smith. Senator Smith has been an advocate for stronger water protections and we'll share a few words 
about the importance of speaking up for water policy. Hi, I'm Senator Tina Smith, and it is great to celebrate the Freshwater Society with you today. Minnesota is blessed with outstanding freshwater resources. The Mississippi River, more than 10,000 lakes, including Lake Superior, and millions of acres of wetlands. These resources are fundamental to who we are and our way of life. The Freshwater Society understands this, and you have been working for over 50 years to conserve, protect, and restore our freshwater resources. And I agree with you. Protecting and restoring fresh water and watersheds is a matter of health, of conservation, and of equity. This is personal for me. Like so many Minnesota families, we love canoeing and fishing. Archie, Sam, and Mason are all fly fishermen, and we love spending time in the Boundary Waters and on Lake Superior. And I have no doubt that our grandson Ari, when he gets old enough, will join these family traditions. As your senator, I've made protecting and improving water quality a top priority. I'm a member of the bipartisan Senate Great Lakes Task Force, where I've advocated for the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative and other programs to protect our lakes. I've also supported the Upper Mississippi River Restoration Program, which focuses on habitat and ecosystems along the Mississippi. These programs and others are just vital as we work to protect freshwater resources in Minnesota and across the Midwest. We also need to understand the intersection between clean water and taking action on climate change. In Washington, I'm fighting for bold, immediate action to fight climate change. We can see that climate change is altering Minnesota's hydrology, is causing unprecedented flooding and contributing to rising water levels in the Great Lakes. Increasingly, severe storms are putting a tremendous strain on wastewater and drinking water infrastructure, which is a serious threat to public health. It's also an issue of equity. Access to clean water should be a basic right, but too often low-income communities and communities of color are disproportionately impacted by water pollution. So I want you to know that I am more than ready to work with the Biden administration to take action on climate in ways that are just and equitable. Before I finish, I just would like to thank my friend and former colleague, John Link Stein, for inviting me to join you today. I'm really proud of the work that I've been able to do with John, and I'm so happy to work alongside Freshwater Society to be your partner in the fight to protect our freshwater resources. I hope you enjoy the rest of the program and that you have a healthy and peaceful December. Thank you so much, Senator Smith. At Freshwater, we know that advocacy for Minnesota's water takes place at all levels of government, including in our own backyard. Next, it's time to head to the Minnesota State Capitol where you'll hear from Paul Gardner, the administrator for the Clean Water Council, about the benefits of the Clean Water Fund for Minnesotans. Paul is a freshwater trained water steward and former state representative. Welcome, Paul. Hi, I'm Paul Gardner, administrator for the Clean Water Council. The Clean Water Council was created in 2006 by state statute to advise the governor and the legislature on how to carry out the Clean Water Legacy Act. That's legislation that requires the state to Im identify impaired waters and come up with a plan for improving water quality, mostly by addressing non-point sources that make up the majority of our water pollution. In addition, the council has the responsibility of recommending how to spend the Clean Water Fund. The Clean Water Fund represents one-third of the increased sales tax revenue from the Clean Water Land and Legacy Amendment approved by voters in 2008. Since then, the Clean Water Fund has supported more than $1.1 billion in activities that Minnesota could not have done with existing funding. Here's the general approach for using the fund. Our state agencies and local government partners have sampled surface waters in all 80 major watersheds in Minnesota to figure out what's wrong or what's doing just fine and needs to be protected. Then they come up with a blueprint based on science that calculates what we have to do to meet measurable water quality goals for each watershed. The state then targets funding at priority areas where the Clean Water Fund can make the biggest difference. In its next set of funding recommendations, the Clean Water Council has set aside 20% of the fund to support protection of drinking water sources. The state accomplishes this by identifying where our aquifers and surface water sources are at risk planning how to reduce those risks, and funding projects that reduce the concentration of contaminants entering our public water supply wells and surface water intakes, or that avoid contamination in the first place. 
Here are some specific examples of activities that get Minnesota to more fishable, swimmable, and drinkable water, many of which are carried out by local units of government like soil and water conservation districts, watershed districts, municipalities, and counties. Increased inspection by counties of septic systems, testing of private wells for nitrates and pesticides, providing technical assistance to farmers, landowners, and local governments so that they understand and use best management practices for water quality, keeping sewage from old septic systems out of lakes in Voyagers National Park, restoring the Duluth Harbor and the St. Louis River from a legacy of industrial pollution, funding projects that promote the use of continuous living cover around public water supply wells and provide income for farmers, upgrading selected water treatment facilities, restoring streams and wetlands, and enrolling thousands of acres into easements to protect shorelines, store water, and reduce nitrogen levels getting into our water supplies. That's just a sampling. They range from complex multi-million dollar construction projects to $5,000 grants to small towns. For every dollar of the Clean Water Fund, we leverage about a dollar of other funds from federal, state, and local governments, and an untold amount of private landowner contributions. The Clean Water Fund won't solve all our water quality problems by 2034. But because of you, the voters and taxpayers of Minnesota, it has supported tools, training, planning, and priority projects whose impact will be felt well after the expiration of the Legacy Amendment. My uh, personal water story is that as a, a, a young man, I volunteered and then eventually became a, a national park ranger at a small unit of the National Park Service outside Washington, D.C. at Great Falls, Virginia, where the uh, Potomac River falls about 76 feet over about a quarter mile. And so I just spent a lot of time looking at the river. And it has a very calming effect. It's very constant. You have that low white noise. And so I've always been attracted to being by the ocean or by the sea, and I get married into Minnesota, so that means rivers <laughs> and lakes <laughs> and not the ocean. And I'm very pleased to also be a Minnesota water steward. <laughs> Through the good work of fresh water in our watershed districts. And so I've been working with folks in my city of Shoreview to help people with inefficient sprinkler systems get them more efficient so they waste less water. And also to look at the possibility of rain barrels or rain gardens or other things that can improve stormwater quality. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. Freshwater has many guiding principles that inform our work. We value community-led solutions for equitable change, science and evidence-based principles as a basis for our advocacy and action, and collaboration, constructive dialogue, and shared leadership. We also value being trusted by people on both sides of the aisle. For this next segment, we spoke to two Minnesota legislators about the importance of legislative engagement from the public and organizations like Freshwater. Representative Paul Torkelson and Representative Peter Fisher. Representative Paul Torkelson from Hanska, Minnesota, uh, in south central part of the state where he lives and farms and represents people from his district at the Minnesota House of Representatives. Uh, Paul, why don't you tell us a little bit about your, your water story? Like most Minnesota kids, my childhood on the farm touched the waters of our state every day starting with a drink of water from our private well and ending with a flush of the toilet that sent wastewater to our private septic system. Additionally, water was a part of recreation from swimming to fishing to water skiing. My first serious forays into water and public policy were a result of my active role in the Minnesota Farm Bureau. I was instrumental in the establishment of the Minnesota Agriculture Water Resource Center. I was appointed to the Clean Water Council prior to the passage of the Legacy Amendment, and I have been a member of the Legislators Clean Water Council since it was reestablished in the legislature a number of years ago. Why is it important that Minnesotans speak up for water at the Minnesota Capitol? Legislators are influenced by the activities of those they know and trust. We pay attention to our constituents when they reach out to us, whether that contact is by phone call, a personal letter, or an email. There is, however, a big difference between communication that comes from an individual's perspective as opposed to something produced by an interest group that is then repeated without the personal perspective. Much of our work at the legislature involves problem solving. We are continually seeking answers to public policy questions, 
answers that support effective and passable legislation. Trusted ad advocacy organizations can help. They can be an important resource for the members of their organization and for the members of the legislature, and they can pool the resources it takes to hire expert staff. Prepared and informed Minnesotans are the most influential. So our last question then is, what's one important water issue you want to address during the coming legislative session? Well, I often say it's hard to be green when you're in the red. Normally I use that adage in a reference to production agriculture, but it applies to Minnesota government too. We will be faced with a budget deficit this year and the resources available to address water quality issues will be limited. One important focus of my work will be the oversight of our ongoing efforts to supply safe drinking water and effective wastewater treatment for all Minnesotans. We depend on infrastructure, both public and private, to get that accomplished. Much of that infrastructure needs repair, replacement, and improvement. Last year's capital investment bill moved us in the right direction, but there are certainly ongoing infrastructure issues to be addressed. Thanks, Paul. That was awesome. I'm doing an interview with Representative Peter Fisher, uh, who is a resident of Maplewood, Minnesota, and also has worked at the Minnesota State Legislature, representing the people of his district for several years now. And uh, Representative Fisher, welcome and thanks for doing this. You're welcome, John. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I'm looking forward to it. So tell us about your water story. What, uh, what's been uh, important in your life about water? Sure. Uh, thank you, John. The uh, important things about water, what uh, has been big for me is that uh, I first learned about water issues when I was very young. My dad used to be chief of the Army Corps of Engineers and his specialty was hydrology, how water flows. And so that became very important as I got old, as I became older, uh, White Bear Lake is an area where hydrology plays a big part as we found out that White Bear Lake was being impacted by the pumping out of the aquifer causing it to drain. And at the same time, the East Metro, another important water issue is contamination that happened in the surface water from old dump sites that contaminated the water in many communities with PFAS chemicals. And so those are things that have been uh, really evolving around myself when I think about water between sustainability and having quality water. Those two go so much hand in hand. Why is it important that Minnesotans speak up for water at the Minnesota Capitol? I think the bigger reason that people should be speaking up for water is because if you don't say anything, it becomes a low priority. And when it's low priority, it gets left behind. And particularly with the challenges that we have during these times of having enough time to deal with all the issues, we cannot afford to leave water behind. And a perfect example I can think of is that there's a move right now to prevent the DNR from uh, classifying waters as public waters so that they can be protected by the state. And if that were to continue to move forward, it would be very difficult for some of our remaining uh, waters that need to be classified as public as being classified as public, which allows us to keep them clean and sustainable for the future. What's one important issue about water that you want to address during the coming legislative session? I think one of the most important issues that I'm looking at for the coming year is getting us to set the aspirational goal of having all of our waters in the state of Minnesota swimmable and fishable within the next 20 years. I think it's a very aggressive goal, but as an aspirational goal, if we don't set it, it doesn't happen. It's like in energy, when we set the standards of having renewable energies at a certain percent, we've exceeded those in a, in a shorter time than what the goals were, but that would not have happened if we had not set the goals. So we should be doing the same thing with our state waters. Love it. Thank you so much, representatives. With those important whys in mind, we turn to Freshwater's Research and Policy Director, Dr. Carrie Jennings, and Senior Program Manager, Jen Cater, for a look at our 2021 legislative agenda. I am Carrie Jennings, Research and Policy Director at Freshwater, and we're here at the Capitol because this is where our effort is going to be for the next couple of months. We have a couple priorities. We like to pretty much hone our message to just two or three key things, and we've done that for this session. But I think before I get into what that message is, I want to tell you a little bit about how we've crafted those messages. I was counting in my head how long I've been in the state working on the geology of the region and the water issues. And 36 years is how long ago I came to Minnesota. And a lot of the people I started graduate school with are still in the area as well. 
and they're placed in agencies and around the state in consulting groups. And it turns out that those relationships have created a really powerful alliance for me at this point in my career. I also have 26 years worth of teaching at the University of Minnesota and my former students are distributed around the state. And what I have learned after doing the geology, mapping the glacial geology of the state and understanding that that's something that can bring us together is it also helps me understand where our current water quality problems are. For years, I like to just present on the geology of the state to people in the regions where I was working. But the questions after the talks often were, but what about this problem? What about this water quality issue? What about how our rivers and lakes are changing? And so my career gradually shifted to trying to answer those questions for them. What I'm able to do now is bring the connections that I've made over the last 30 some years to bear on these questions and find pragmatic solutions for them. And that's the kind of work that we present at the Capitol. We try to have very concrete solutions for the water quality and quantity problems that the state is facing. We try to find the best tools for the state going forward in a changing water environment. And we try to connect the researchers at the University of Minnesota to these same pragmatic questions and the solutions that the state is looking for. So we're a calm voice at the Capitol. We're not here very often. We rely on our um, conservation strategies representatives. This is Judy Erickson and Joe Burkholz. The efforts that we're focusing on this session were, one of them was almost through last session, that, but that session was disrupted by the COVID kind of fiasco and how things broke down. But we had a bill with bipartisan support to promote water storage in the Minnesota River Basin. This is our effort that has been going on for 12 years, I would say, based on the fundamental science that started 12 years ago, that shows that too much water is coming from the land mass in the Minnesota River Basin, and that's creating a host of problems, including nutrient loading to the streams and also sediment loading because of erosion of our channels. So if we can just keep that water where it falls, compensate farmers for that activity, then we can start to restore our hydrology in that basin. The second effort that we're going to focus on is promoting the research that the legislature funded two years ago. Two years ago, the state funded Freshwater and a group of collaborators to investigate a new tool for storing water in the ground. This is aquifer storage and recovery. And we have successfully completed the project despite COVID and lockdowns, and we'll be delivering the results of that project to the legislature this session. We will accompany that report with recommendations for how ASR could be a tool going forward um, for Minnesota to kind of build in resilience to climate change and um, overdrafting of aquifers. The favorite part of my job at Freshwater is building teams to address the research questions that the state has, that the state might not know it has, but digging deep into my pool of collaborators across the state and departments at the university and building just the right team to approach a problem that needs solving. Hi, my name's Jen Cater. I'm Freshwater's Senior Program Manager and I lead our participatory engagement work around the state. I didn't know that I was going to be interested in working in the environmental field as I was growing up. I didn't uh, know even as I was finishing out high school that that was what I wanted to do, but somehow my life kept on coming back to water in one way or another. My favorite place to go as I was uh, coming home from school before dinner would happen was down to a local park where there was a pond that I could sit next to and just kind of watch and see what was happening and uh, just interact with water on a daily basis. Uh, whenever we would travel, we would travel to somewhere that was near water and to take a lot of solace and comfort in just listening to the water hit the shore, uh, watching birds come in and land on it, or even taking the canoe out. And just the more and more that I think back on the way that water has intersected my life, it's always been this constant presence thing. And as I got more involved in working on climate change, got more involved working on uh, food systems and working with policy, I really noticed that I had a strong draw to working on water resources and making sure that we're protecting that water, keeping it clean, cleaning up the stuff that's not clean, and making sure that other future generations have the same sort of opportunities that I had to just enjoy and interact with water on a daily basis. 
This year, we are really gearing up for what can be a really challenging conversation around the budget at the Capitol. Uh, there's going to be a lot of difficult conversations around what's really good programs, really good uh, initiatives, really good efforts are not going to be funded this year simply because the funding isn't there. And that's one reason why uh, we're really thankful to the people who worked on the Legacy Fund and other dedicated funds for the fact that they made them dedicated funds, protected funds. And they did that with the wisdom of acknowledging that there will be times like this. They anticipated that we'd be faced with difficult conversations around short-term budget adjustments that would be necessary. And we've faced them before, we're facing them now, we're going to face them again. And making sure as we go into this next session that these dedicated funds truly do remain dedicated is going to be important. That means that we want to see them used for their intended purposes and not used for things that are outside of what voters decided was important or was otherwise uh, written into how these funds are intended to be used. A lot of the work that we've been engaged with with our policy efforts at Freshwater over the course of the last couple of years have actually focused in on the Clean Water Fund, which is one of those dedicated funds that's constitutionally protected. And the work that we did with the Trajectory Project a couple of years ago, the ongoing work that we're continuing to do with the Clean Water Council and state agencies is really focused on making sure that that fund does live up to its intended outcomes and that we are on a good trajectory to see clean water in our future. And we're going to be continuing that work. We're still implementing the recommendations that came out of that process, and that's work that we uh, do beyond the walls of the Capitol as well as with state agencies and local communities. Thank you so much for joining us on this journey upstream. Whether you're new to this work or experienced, we hope that we've equipped you with new knowledge about the policies that shape our waters for future generations along with the key initiatives we are working on this year. We hope you will take a moment to reflect on your own water story and your own connections to the waters of our communities. Visit our website for additional ways you can get involved. From tracking a bill, to hosting a river cleanup, to becoming a water steward, or making a donation, there are countless ways to move our actions upstream. Thank you. Stay safe, stay healthy.